from the heart of where innovation, money, and power collide. In Silicon Valley and beyond, this is Bloomberg Technology with Emily Chang. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco, and this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up in the next hour, whoever said streaming is slowing down didn't tell Disney, the company reporting a major increase in subscribers for Disney+. Plus. This after concerns following Netflix's shocking drop. We're going to break down the numbers and where the streaming business goes from here. Plus, how low can crypto go? The massive sell-off that started with tech is spilling over to cryptocurrencies. Bitcoin and Ether have both fallen more than 50% since record highs last year. And Google gives us a sneak peek at AR glasses. What can they do and when can you get your hands on them? And how do they not repeat the failures of Google Glass? A top Google exec will join us. We'll get to all of that in a moment, but first let's get a look at the market. Stocks sliding on signs inflation isn't going away anytime soon. And the Nasdaq closing down 3%. Bloomberg's Emily Grafeo here with the latest. Emily, walk us through the day. Hi, Emily. Well, it was another volatile day for the U.S. equity market. The S&P 500 ended down over 1.6%, but the pain was really concentrated in those tech stocks. We saw the Nasdaq 100 fall over 3%. Big tech giants like Tesla and Apple were really falling along with the index. And this, of course, came after we had some CPI data that showed investors inflation is higher than expected and probably going to prompt the Federal Reserve to continue on that aggressive monetary tightening path that doesn't really bode well for high growth stocks. The yield on the U.S. tenure was lower for the third day, but didn't seem to provide any support for U.S. stocks. Also, the dollar finishing the day in New York largely flat, but still approaching its largest, its highest levels since May 2020. We talked about uh, a little bit of pain in tech stocks, but the pain is even worse when you look at the crypto markets. Bitcoin falling below that key $30,000 level. Um, this, of course, was near an 11-month low, and we're also seeing Ethereum down about 43% year to date. The risk-off mood in market has kind of been weighing on cryptos pretty much all year, but the pain right now is really being felt because of the plunge in Terra. It's an algorithmic stablecoin, but it lost its dollar peg earlier this week. It plunged about 80% today, pared back some of those losses just a little bit, but really worrying those crypto investors we also saw Luna, which is a crypto token that's linked um, and helps maintain the Terra peg also fall. There was an exchange traded product from 21 shares that tracks Terra. It fell over 90% today. And I heard from Bloomberg Intelligence's uh, Eric Balchunas, that is one of the worst single day exchange traded product declines in ETP history ever. So a lot of losses there. Let's get to Disney though. They reported earnings missed on revenue also uh, missed on EPS, but they did beat on Disney Plus subscribers, reporting more Disney Plus subscribers than expected. Quite a change from um, its streaming competitor, Netflix, which of course the stock plunged after they reported earnings. Disney actually down a little bit in the post market. You zoom out year to date, Disney is down over 30%. So we'll see how analysts are taking this earnings report that was largely positive. All right, Bloomberg's Emily Grafeo, thank you. I want to stick with Disney now, talk more about those results with Ross Gerber, president and CEO of Gerber Kawasaki, a longtime Disney shareholder. So look, Ross, Hulu and ESPN Plus subscribers a little light, but you have to look at that massive subscriber increase and feel some sense of relief, even surprise. I don't know. Is this what you were expecting? Well, we didn't really have much expectation as far as subscriber because it's so hard to predict what you know, consumers do based off what content's being released on each streamer. But what we now see at the, you know at the end of this earnings period is that Netflix did lose a certain amount of subs subscribers to the competitors. One being Disney Plus, and and the other being you know Peacock or and, and Paramount Plus. So um, you know certainly we don't know if that's a permanent change in behavior because we think streamers go back and forth between what you know shows are you know, popular at the time. So Disney had very good results for their um, their streaming businesses and, and much better than we expected because obviously we thought they had a tough comparison to the COVID era. And, you know, quite frankly, all of their businesses are starting to improve now and we're starting to see revenue dramatically increase in parks and resorts and, and actually a wonderful weekend at the theaters this weekend. So, 
you know, with the valuations so cheap now in the stock market, stocks like Disney are quite compelling for long-term investors. I thought what CEO Bob Chapek had to say about Disney Plus subscribers who are grown-ups but don't have children was really interesting. Take a quick listen to what he had to say. It's certainly popular with families, but as a reminder, almost half of Disney Plus subscribers are adults without kids. And he said he's going to try to cater more to that audience. What do you make of that strategy? Well, I think his point is really trying to broaden the market because obviously Disney Plus is just a no-brainer if you have kids. So, you know, what would be your impetus to, to getting what is perceived as a kid's channel? But see, when you're talking about adults, you're talking about Gen Xers like us who have grown up with Star Wars. And so what he's really saying is that there's an enormous audience base of people who don't have kids who are really into the the IP like, you know, Star Wars and Marvel movies. And, you know, you think, oh, these are kids movies, but they're actually not. You know, they're adult movies and it's adult content. And I think that's why they've been successful is that there is stuff for different age groups on Disney+. Plus. How do you think Disney Plus holds up if Netflix releases a lower priced ad supported tier? I don't really see it as an issue. Like, so look at it this way. So you have ma basically three main streamers now with, with Hulu, Disney+, Plus, Netflix, and what will be HBO, Discover, or whatever that is. Those will be the three main players. And then you have Amazon and Apple are the players that don't charge for streaming services, and they try to sell other products. And so when you look at the, you know, environment that's out there today, I think Disney's extremely well positioned in the multiple content offerings also with ESPN plus their uh, agreement with UFC and and really their numbers would have been completely blowout numbers if it weren't for the billion dollars they had to pay producers and other people to to put stuff on the streamers instead of in the theaters over the last year or two so Disney took a big hit you know investing in the streamers but that's going to pay off big time for them long term meantime he's talking about rolling out into 53 new markets. Obviously, we've talked a lot about Netflix's global appeal, a lot of con you know, new content coming in from, for example, South Korea and the success right. of Squid Game. Do you think Disney can repeat that? No, and I don't think it would benefit them to. You know, Disney has a different approach to content. So if I make a Pixar movie, that will play in all countries in the world. You just change the language. But the content works globally, where Netflix doesn't make kids content, really. And so it doesn't work globally. So I've recently watched a lot of the uh, Asian-based shows that they've been making, uh, Korean dramas, uh, Japanese crime movies. You know, I watch some of these stuff on Netflix. And Netflix has a far deeper approach to the local cultures and artistic sensibilities than I think the approach Disney has. So I think that Netflix ultimately is going to be much more successful internationally. And I think what Disney's really focused on is you have Hotstar in India, where they, they're they a main player in India, and it's a massive market. And I think they're very focused on that market. And it makes a lot of sense for them to focus on bigger markets where they can put money into content and not have to spread it between so many regions. Um, so let's so talk I, about I parks. Let's move on and talk about parks because, you know, Chapek saying domestic parks are firing on all cylinders, but they might have to take a big hit to operating income, $350 million potentially because of the closures of its parks in Hong Kong and Shanghai due to the pandemic. And as we know, Shanghai is on a very restrictive lockdown to this day. How concerned are you about that? I mean, for me, this is probably the biggest concern I have as an investor right now. You know, I'm I'm not that worried about the Fed, actually, because I, you know, it's easy for them to stop causing pain. But like China has, we have a lot of business that we do in China, whether it's Apple, Tesla or Disney and many others. And and this approach in Shanghai has been hugely detrimental to the economy in China, to the people in China. And it may or may not work. I'm less believing that it's going to work. So, so this is a big issue for for Disney on the short term, and 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 maybe even on the medium and long term in in a country like China. 
So I, I don't expect it to be easy for Disney to do business in China for the, the foreseeable future because of their goal of having no COVID and, and the fact that theme parks are sort of the exact opposite of what you know the Chinese government wants people doing right now. But I do think that that's more a short-term issue than a long-term one, but one that okay. will weigh on Disney. Well, I wonder if you think doing business in Florida being more difficult is a short or long-term issue. You have, you've been pretty clear that you're not a huge fan of Bob Chapek. You don't think he handled this situation in Florida very well. Disney is now losing these special privileges that they've enjoyed in Florida for decades uh, as a result of this you know, very controversial don't say gay bill. And you know, it's clear that lawmakers in Florida are you know, taking this out on Disney What's your take on JPEG now? Now that you see these numbers, are you having a change of heart at all, or are you no. still not a fan? Well, I mean, he, he just fired the PR guy, right, uh, uh, for for what's going on in Florida. Um, you know, I, I, there's a lot of things I don't think he's handling the way I wish. The Florida situation is a really tough one, but I think that Disney wins in the end, because in the end, whether you're on the right wing or the left wing, your kids want to go to Disneyland. And, and there's a lot of people who type stuff onto Twitter or Facebook, but then they go to Disneyland. So, you know, I don't think that that's such an issue. And and really, the, the politicians in Florida are sounding the people of Florida with higher costs, higher debts and taxes, because Disney's actually relationship benefits Florida. So what I think is this will smooth out over time. And I think these political wars over the right and the left are more played out in the media than in people's actual behavior. All right, we're continuing to get headlines from the call. Disney saying they still expect Disney Plus to grow even more in the second half of the year, though maybe not as much as we've seen it grow in the first half of the year. So that, uh, of course, the number to watch, that big subscriber number, Ross Gerber, co-founder of Gerber Kawasaki. Always love having you on the show, Ross. Thank you for stopping by. Coming up, the route isn't over for tech stocks. The Nasdaq falling Wednesday to the lowest level since November 2020. We're going to talk about how persistent inflation is weighing on growth stocks. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg. There are a lot of things that are going on, um, a lot of different disturbances around the world. But you know, for us, it's really about focusing on our long-term strategy. So as mortgage rates have gone up, and and they're gonna, they still have further to go. Clearly, home buyers are gonna have to trade down to slightly lower price points. But most of the data that I've seen around housing still predicts strong housing appreciation. I think uh, people are overreacting to uh, some of the inflation worries, some of the other travel players. Well, we've been studying inflation pretty carefully now for the past four to six quarters, because I think it happened actually, um, or, or, or the growth of inflation, I should say, you know, occurred maybe a, a bit sh more sharply than some had anticipated. And, and it certainly it continues to be a real concern. Some top tech execs there we've had right here on Bloomberg Technology reacting to concerns about rising inflation. Wednesday's report painting a troubling bigger picture for tech, especially as the Fed tries to combat rising prices. All of this adding to the decline we've seen in tech stocks in particular. For more on this, I'm joined by Steve Saracino, founder and partner at Activant Capital. Steve, thank you so much for joining us. So what do you think the impact more broadly of inflation has been so far on tech? Well, when we went and looked back at the 70s during the stagflation period, the best performing sector was actually consumer products and the worst performing was information technology. You know, and I think that's a testament to how mission critical a lot of the you know software and computers were back then for businesses. It's much more mis mission critical today. And so we expect actually tech to perform a lot better where it's going to where it's going to show up in the form of pain or equity prices declining or those um, software programs that businesses use as on an ancillary basis for things that are just not core to the business. So we do affect and uh, we do expect inflation to affect technology pretty dramatically. And in growth stocks, we've already seen it as they're down 60 to 70 percent pretty much across the board. And we're seeing it in the private markets as well. So by dramatically, what do you expect the impacts of that will be? You know, massive down rounds, inability to fundraise, more layoffs? Yeah, OK. So you hit on all the key factors. Uh, we saw this before in the dot-com bust. There's a very strong anchoring bias in the private markets. For the last 
12 years and even through the great financial crisis, growth stocks really um, never went down. And so it's going to take time um, for prices to adjust. We're seeing the early cracks, um, some of which come in the form of less competition. We're also seeing converts. And what converts do is maintain an equity price but allow a company to extend its runway. What follows converts is always down rounds. Um, the other thing that's coming, and we saw this today with Carvana or layoffs, you know, we think in technology, the layoffs are actually going to be shocking. They're going to be shocking, Emily. And we've seen Meta and Facebook freeze hiring, the same with Uber. And it's it, this will be in the millions of people in the next 12 to 24 months. This is just the beginning. So you're comparing it to the dot-com bust. I mean, just how close a comparison is there? I mean, do you think this could take 12 years to play out? So if unclear how long it will take. Our current view is that over the next 12 months, it's going to be very rocky. Back half of next year, things should firm up in the tech sector. The dot-com bust, you know, look, that was unique to that time period. Our time period, um, more liquidity, company business models are a little bit stronger. There's a better understanding of, you know, how to get the cash flow and profitability um, at the management team level, at the board level, and those discussions are happening right now. So I suspect that the downturn will be a little bit more violent, but the recovery, recovery will be faster. And in the next kind of 12 to 24 months, you're going to see some really interesting opportunities. But we've got to flush through these down rounds. And companies with six to 12 months of capital left are really going to struggle to raise, raise money in this environment. So who makes it out of the gauntlet? Who doesn't? So those with fortified balance sheets, those companies that got ahead of fortifying the balance sheet by you know, trimming staff when necessary. It's always unfortunate to do layoffs, but it's it's part of what needs to happen during a downturn. Um, and where you're going to see the most pain is on the uh, uh, the larger businesses, the unicorns. The smaller companies that can adapt um, and extend runway three or more years should be OK. Those that have less than two years are, are going to struggle. Um, you know, more broadly, what's going to work? Commerce, commerce infrastructure, anything to do with e-commerce, FinTech, although we're seeing competition increase, and it's been a bloodbath both in the private and the public markets, and then transportation, okay. logistics, and security. Wow. They're giving it to us straight. Steve Saracino, <laughs> Activate Capital founder, uh, will be watching. Well, it was billed as the biggest change to Airbnb in a decade. We have the biggest updates to our product in 10 years. We've been thinking about this for a very long period of time. I can't say a lot, but I'll just give a couple of clues. Number one, there'll be a whole new way to search on Airbnb. And this new way to search is going to be a new way to find really interesting homes. And then the second thing is we're going to have a big step change to our service level and the kind of customer service we offer. Airbnb has now revealed its big update, which includes a new way to search for homes, split your trips between a couple of homes, and perhaps the biggest upgrade, more protections while traveling. They are calling it Air Cover, which includes a number of guarantees on your booking check-in and what they're calling a get-what-you-booked promise. We will talk about all that and more with Airbnb CEO and co-founder Brian Chesky tomorrow on the show. And coming up. We need a name. We. We live. We dream. We work. What didn't work at WeWork and what lessons can tech companies learn from it as we navigate market turmoil and employers try to get workers back to the office? We're going to talk about all that and more with a former WeWork exec next. This is Bloomberg. From Wall Street to Silicon Valley, companies are competing fiercely for talent and to avoid losing more employees are tweaking in-person requirements, even going fully remote. I want to talk about all this and more with Melissa Daimler, Chief Learning Officer at the online teaching platform Udemy and former WeWork executive. She is out with a new book called Reculturing, Design Your Company Culture to Connect with Strategy and Purpose for Lasting Success. Melissa, the pandemic has totally reshaped the workplace for better or for worse. How should companies reculture in this environment? Yeah, so I, the biggest question I always get right now is how do we bring our culture back? And that is the wrong question because it assumes that culture is the office. And while I think a lot of us 
enjoyed the ping pong tables and enjoyed the donuts and the free food. That is not what culture is. Culture is how work happens between people. And so I think the focus needs to be more on the values and the behaviors and, and how we're showing up with each other through different ways of communicating versus how we can get back, back people into an office. So let's talk about what companies are doing wrong. I mean, you've got companies, you know, changing their work from home policies, trying to, you know, create these new perks for when people are in the office. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, you know, it, it comes down to uh, going a little deeper than uh, just defining your values. I think companies stop when they have a list of values on the wall or they throw them up on a website. I think the companies that are thinking through this and we're doing this at Udemy are really trying to codify what culture is. What would it, what would a, a value, for instance, of teamwork, how would that show up? You know, is that collaborating with each other effectively? Is that constructive debate? And how do we do that in a way that is in this hybrid environment? What are what are opportunities for us to come back together in an office if it's more of a brainstorming opportunity versus, you know, when can we do it remotely? So I think it's less about how we can get people back into the office or, you know, how do we how do we make sure that, that we're continuing to um, okay. figure out okay. ways to provide food? It's more about how to connect. So quickly, what are some parallels you can draw from your experience at WeWork and what we're seeing right now in tech, market turmoil, companies getting punished, you know, whether you're growing or not? Mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I think of uh, organizations, again, as, as a total system. And I, and I think at WeWork, and a lot of companies get this wrong, I think we think of culture as this is separate HR initiative versus continuing to look at how to reconnect it to your purpose, to your strategy, and closing those gaps. So if you're if your mission is to, um, you know, to to make a life not a living, and then you invest in wave pools, there's a gap okay. there. You know, yeah. All right. Uh, well, you can check out your new book out now. Melissa Daimler, Chief Learning Officer at Udemy. Thanks so much for joining us. Coming up, Google is back with high tech classes. We're going to have the rundown of all the announcements at I.O. and when you can get your hands on and eyes in to these new products. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. We've got some breaking news now. Headlines involving Twitter. The Dow Jones reporting that federal regulators are investigating Elon Musk's disclosure of his sizable stake in Twitter. The report saying that the SEC is probing his late submission of a public form that investors must file when they buy more than 5% of a company's shares. As we know, he started amassing Twitter shares back in January, but didn't reveal his stake until April. We're gonna have more on that story as we get more details. Meantime, Google just unveils a series of upgrades to its search and map services, revealing more about the company's augmented reality ambitions and a slew of new products like the 6A phone and a Google Pixel watch to rival Apple Watch and even a pair of new AR glasses. Rick Osterloh, Alphabet Senior Vice President of Devices and Services, joins us now for more on all this. Rick, lots to get through here. Let's talk about the phone first, the 6 and 6A. Uh, talk to us about the strategy here and the need for high and lower end devices. You bet. Well, thanks so much for having me, Emily. Uh, first off, I, I just mentioned, uh, you know, our vision for computing is a vision that we call ambient computing, where Computers should be able to help you with whatever you need seamlessly and, and kind of be all around you. The center of that universe is really phones today. And, and that's why we uh, are investing so much in this area. Um, Google Tensor is our technology substrate for these phones. Um, it's a system on a chip that powers all of them. And today we introduced Pixel 6a, which is a $449 
uh, version of the Pixel phone that includes our premium Tensor SOC uh, and can do all sorts of great things for users around speech recognition and photography. So, so that's pretty key. You know, later in the year, we'll on the phone arena, we'll be also launching our pre our next version of our premium lineup of phones called Pixel Seven. So we talked a little bit about about that too. So let's talk about the Google Pitch Pixel Watch. How do you think it stacks up to Apple Watch? And, and how many of these do you think you can sell? Well, I mean, first of all, we think it's going to be a terrific offering. I, I've got it right here. It's a beautiful device, round, uh, uh, circular design with stainless steel and, and beautiful features. Um, some of the key things, you know, for anyone that uses a Pixel phone, or Pixel family of devices, this is going to be the watch for them. It deeply integrates with Google's ecosystem of products. You can get turn by turn directions without having your phone. You could use Google Wallet to pay for anything. Google Home app will be on there. You can do your uh, smart home controls. And of course the best part is it deeply integrates with Fitbit. I've been a Fitbit user for 10 years. So everything I do on here seamlessly syncs with my Fitbit account. I can get heart rate tracking, sleep tracking, uh, all the latest features for health and wellness. So it's, it's really exciting. I think people are going to love this product. Any chance you've got a pair of those new AR glasses in your pocket too? Uh, I, I don't have them with me. Uh, they're, it's a prototype. We're, uh, of course, been involved in the AR space for a very long time. Um, and we're really excited about the advances we've made. We see this area being just a key part of the ambient computing vision. You could see how wonderful it would be to have something on your face uh, that enables you to do real-time communication, to do translation, to be able to live caption the world around you. All of this powered by powerful technology in, with our AR systems and with Tensor. And so, you know, we were excited to show a little bit about the future here. Obviously, it's a, a bit of a ways off. This is a prototype, but we are very much continuing to invest in the AR space, and we see it as a key part of where we're headed with ambient computing in the future. So tell us more about how the glasses work. Is this like Google Translate on a pair of glasses, or is it something more? Well, you know, it's going to end up being a lot more, but it's very early days. I mean, what we showed was a prototype, and we don't have like a ton of product details to share today. We were just showing a little bit about you know, how uh, one facet of how it might work with powerful speech recognition and translation. We do have a lot of AR capabilities on smartphones today. You can see that throughout everything we do with Lens and Google Maps and things like that. So you'll see a lot of continued investment in the AR space. We believe strongly in offering users help in the real world. And that's what we're very focused on with our AR efforts. So where are you? on the glasses in the research stage right now? Do you have a limited number of users testing it? I mean, how far along are you with this prototype? Oh, I mean, you know, we have, we have a number of engineers and developers uh, continuing to build product in this space for internal use. And, uh, you know, we're, we, we're still in the research phase, so it'll be quite a ways uh, off, but we're very excited about where it is headed. And is it based on AI image processing? I mean, there must be a lot going on on, on the back end there to make all this work. Um, well, yeah, it's, I mean, AR is one of the more sophisticated uh, computing capabilities that's, that's required to offer useful information to people. Um, we have, in, of course, a great prowess in our computing capabilities in the data center. What's been new is that we're adding a lot of intelligence to endpoints, and, and you can see an indication of that with Google Tensor. Um, we're able to leverage both of these capabilities uh, together to be able to really offer this sort of powerful experience in the future. So the big question is when, when will these be available for consumers or how many years out are we talking? More to come, but it's not, it's not imminent. We're definitely in the prototyping stage. So uh, we'll, we'll make sure to tell you, Emily, when they're about to be out. <laughs> And okay, last question on the glasses, but look, Google Glass wasn't necessarily the consumer success you hoped it would be, it, you know, became the butt of a few jokes. How do you avoid that same fate with another set of glasses? I mean, we learned so much from the introduction of Google Glass. Um, we, we clearly learned how hard it is to develop this kind of technology and learned a lot about what users care about and, and what's important. Um, so, so I think that that informs us 
uh, and gives us just a great background to understand what we need to do in this space. So we're very glad that we had that initial effort. Um, it's really helped us think through where we need to be for the future. So we're very, we're excited about it. We're using all the learning from our prior entry into this space. And, uh, and I think you'll see a lot of the benefit of that in the future. So you said you also plan to release a tablet next year as a companion to Pixel. And you know, I believe back in 2019, you said no more tablets. So, so why the change of heart? Well, you know, I think um, we, the Android team has really invested a lot in larger screen devices, larger form factors. And I think in, in the last couple of years in the pandemic, it, it became really clear how important having these large screen devices is for the home for various use cases. And so uh, between all of those um, collective things at once, we decided that it was really important for us to develop one. And it really does provide a new facet, new experience for Pixel users. So we thought it was important to have it as part of the Pixel portfolio. So just how many facets will there be? Is this a foldable tablet we're talking about? Oh, um, you know, we just talked, we just showed uh, a little bit of a prototype of what we're building right now today, which is a standard tablet. And uh, there'll be a lot more details shared next year when it comes to market. Okay, so bigger picture, how do you measure the success of Google's hardware division? I mean, comparatively, when you look at other companies and you compare the numbers, Google is not quite there, but obviously it's still growing and it's still a place that you're investing. What's the bar for you? Well, I mean, you know, clearly we want this to be a very large business for the company and it has been growing quite significantly. For, for instance, um, we talked about at our earnings that Pixel 6 uh, has sold more in its first six months than Pixel 4 and Pixel 5 combined. Um, so, so without a doubt, you know, we're investing a lot in this area and we also are growing a lot. And our intention is to continue to grow the business. We're, we're no doubt a uh, challenger in this space. We're a new entrant relative to other people who've been in it. So we're starting from a very small base, but we do expect to continue to grow and we're investing uh, in the future for that. And that's why you see you know, us make investments like uh, the Pixel uh, uh, sponsorship for the NBA playoffs, which have been just terrific to see and terrific games to watch. So. Um, uh, yeah, this is going to be a space we definitely invest in and grow in the future. So in the future, how big a piece of the pie do you think or do you see hardware being in the overall Google whole? Well, we'll see. Uh, you know, hopefully it'll become a meaningful part. Obviously, we're quite a quite a large and successful business as it stands, and we hope to be a contributing part of that. All right. Rick Osterlo, Alphabet Senior Vice President of Devices and Services. Thanks for giving us a little peek into the future. Appreciate you stopping by. Thanks, right. Emily. Coinbase shares coming up, falling to new lows in this ongoing bear market. We're going to talk about all that and more with Voyager Digital, another crypto exchange next. This is Bloomberg. Time now for our crypto report, and I want to get another look at Coinbase shares falling to new lows. Even the word bankruptcy, the big B word being floated. Our crypto contributor, Shanali Basak, here with more. Shanali? Thank you so much, Emily. When we talk about what happened with Coinbase today, you do have shares and bonds of Coinbase plunging to new lows after results disappointed Wall Street. Really, Goldman Sachs coming in and saying here that Coinbase is un unlikely to return to recent levels of profitability in the near term. In a quarterly report, they added a disclosure that if the company filed for bankruptcy, the court might treat the customer assets uh, as a line for repayment, meaning the customer assets are what are going to be at play here. But you also, I want to be very clear about this, having Brian Armstrong, really the CEO, saying that this is about a disclosure about how they hold the crypto assets and not really a, a statement about the chance of bankruptcy at Coinbase. While that's not a risk in the near term here, he is saying that your funds here are safe at Coinbase. Still, you do have a huge drop off in the shares and a lot of questions about the exchange business moving forward. To answer some of those questions, Emily, I want to bring in Steve Ehrlich now. He's the CEO of crypto asset trading platform Voyager Digital. Steve, you're a long time member of the trading community, both from stocks and now to cryptocurrencies. When you 
look at the exchange model moving forward, a lot of concerns here about profitability. How do you make this work in a down market? Well, look, I think that you know the exchange model is something that has become very profitable across traditional exchanges. So we're in the early stages of adoption of crypto, uh, especially in the U.S. We are working through you know thoughtful regulation. So my belief is the exchange model will become you know, extremely profitable over time, but we're going to have bumps in the road until we get there. And today is one of those bumps in the road. But you know, I'm, I'm really you know, bullish on the exchange model and the industry in general. You know, I want to talk more about Coinbase for a second here because the idea that there is a claim on assets here at the end of the day, if there were to be bankruptcy, a lot of firms have not gone public yet. So they don't have similar disclo disclosures. What kind of a risk does that really entail? And what does that make the customer really aware of at the end of the day if things you know, go to zero? It's really interesting because the SEC came down and said, I think in the prior quarters, they didn't disclose the level of customer assets that they were holding, but the SEC changed disclosures and said, hey, if you're holding customer assets, you now have to put it on your asset and liability side of your balance sheet. So now that disclosure is there and we see how much assets they really do have. But to your point, a public company like Coinbase, like Voyager, we've been disclosing that since day one and we've been public three years now. I think that's actually a good thing for consumers because now they see that our assets do cover all the liabilities. We're nowhere near any, any bankruptcy situation in either case. And you now have more clarity than if you were you know, investing in a private company and holding your assets with a private company with no required disclosures. So what about the model itself in terms of making money? There's a lot of questions around there, around whether fees really start to go to zero, kind of like you saw in the stock market yeah. as spread started to come in. Look, I think that you know, there's, there's a place in this business for commissions. Consumers are getting a great price. Uh, great, you know, action on all their trades. Uh, but I do think that, you know, there's no national best bid and offer. This is where the market actually changes and is different for crypto versus the traditional markets. The traditional markets have reg NMS, a national best bidder offer. So you have, you know, price protection on every trade. In the crypto market, you don't. And that's why I think we're looking for thoughtful regulation. But as long as there's exchanges around the globe holding and trading all these cryptos, there's opportunities for commissions and for spreads for every, everybody in the industry. Now, I want to talk more about price protection, yep. as you say. Let's talk about it as it pertains to UST. Now trading at about 70 cents on the dollar. You made a decision hmm. not to list UST, but you did list Luna. Why is that? Yeah, so when we looked at the underlying of UST, we saw it truly wasn't a stable coin in the same instance as USDC. Now, USDC, the US dollar stable coin by Circle and Coinbase, is backed by US dollars and US treasuries. So, and it has an attestation from a prominent accounting firm in Grant Thornton. We felt very comfortable, and we still do, that there always will be a dollar for dollar there. When we looked at UST, we didn't see the same assets behind it. And so we were uncomfortable in bringing that to our customers. But we did list Luna only from an aspect of price action that consumers can actually participate and, and trade Luna, but not take it off the platform, because one of the main reasons to take it off the platform was to stake it for UST and earn those rewards. We didn't feel comfortable always thinking about the customer first and how they were going to look at the trade and the asset. We chose not to list UST and to list Luna. How, do you think more exchanges are going to be more discerning moving forward about the types of assets that they do list, especially when it comes to DeFi? I, I definitely think that, you know, exchanges, everybody's going to take a different look about how they list their coins. We go through a really detailed process, and I think everybody's starting and going to expand their processes for that, processes for that as well. I do think we saw, a, we saw a flight out of DeFi today. We saw a lot of consumers bringing their assets back to a centralized, you know, place like us, uh, so they can actually be comfortable in holding the assets because in the DeFi world, you're putting your assets into some contract and going to get some reward on it. But now we see that those rewards may not be as good as they look. And to trust another party to do a lot of the work and diligence for you, we saw massive inflows today and massive trading volume today. So what then is the ultimate ramification for DeFi into this year, given that it's not just UST that is falling, you see Bitcoin falling as well below that 30,000 yep. mark that everyone was watching. Look, I think that this is an opportunity for a reset opportunity. I think, 
you know, UST did have an impact on the entire market today because UST was backed by Bitcoin and there was a lot of selling of Bitcoin related to the UST. So I think you're seeing a reset time. I think we're close to the bottom here uh, if we're not there already and we'll see that rebound. But it's truly an opportunity for people to learn more and that's the key thing here. Individuals, consumers, brokers like us, we need to educate people more. We need to educate consumers why these cryptocurrencies matter and therefore then they could make an educated decision on which ones to own. Steve, thank you so much. That is Stephen Ehrlich, CEO of Voyager Digital. Emily, back to you. Shanali, thank you. Well, Nike is escalating its legal battle with the sneaker marketplace StockX saying it purchased four pairs of counterfeit shoes on the platform despite them advertising authentic footwear. This after Nike sued StockX back in February, accusing it of free riding on Nike's trademarks with a service called Vault NFTs. StockX argues its NFTs aren't digital sneakers, but simply listings for physical sneakers that are stored in its vault and can be traded by users. Coming up, back to those Disney earnings. We're going to hear what CEO Bob Chapek had to say about pricing power for Disney Plus and an update on Rivian results and its production goals. All of that coming up next. This is Bloomberg. We believe that we can, you know, sort of move up and cascade up our net price over time given the tremendous value that we started with and the increased uh, price value relationship all of all the new content. But uh, we're pretty bullish about that. Disney CEO Bob Chapek there on the company's earnings call speaking about pricing power and future pricing power for Disney Plus. Disney saw big growth in subscribers beating estimates. The service finishing the quarter with 137.7 million subscribers globally, up 33% from a year ago. Disney, not the only one reporting results today. EV maker Rivian also out with its earnings, and our Ed Ludlow has been listening in on the call. So shares up modestly. Ed, right. what are the headline takeaways? It's still really hard out there for Rivian, but it was as good as it could be. They're still planning to build 25,000 EVs this year, split across the consumer product and the van for Amazon. Semiconductors are still hard. Sell supply is still hard, but I think the good news for investors is they got a lot of trucks built, sitting in a parking lot somewhere waiting to be delivered, and they're finding out the hard way. It's not easy being a real company. Mm. What about the supply chain crisis, and right. especially what's going on with China? Are they feeling the brunt of that? I think they're disappointed. They, they've built 5,000 vehicles since production started, around 2,500 in the quarter. But at times, they had to pause the line. Literally, you've seen the video, right? I've been mm -hmm. inside the factory. All these great robotic arms just stopped because they don't have enough parts. Semiconductors is a big issue still. But they say that they're speaking to their suppliers. We've seen the worst of it. We've hit the bottom. And we're going to get better from here. He also disputed some reports from the Wall Street Journal about battery cell supply. And said, actually, if you look over a five-year horizon, battery cell supply is fine. It's longer term when we all start building EVs. The whole world's clamoring for an electric car. That's where it becomes a concern. Did they have anything to say about Amazon? Yeah, a lot to say about Amazon. <laughs> Progress on Amazon. You know, the 25,000 figure for this year includes 10,000 vans for Amazon. And what's interesting is they're building it in two sizes, for want of a better description, big and small. The big is really underway. The small is in development. And they're on track. And they're starting to roll out more and more pilots of Amazon in cities around the country. Adam Jonas from Morgan Stanley really grilled Ooh. them. Yeah. What, and it, did he get anywhere? He kind of got somewhere. His point was that you look at the, the equity story. Rivian has fallen from $172 a share following its IPO to around $20 a share. Investors have lost patience for company that burn, companies that just burn through cash. Mm -hmm. He wanted to know, how are you going to do better? Mm -hmm. How are you going to limit your costs? How are you going to spread out spending smartly? They gave very detailed but very safe answers. And you can see the stock reaction is kind of modest in after hours. But it's up. Right. And given the tough time, that's a positive. Exactly. Well, certainly it matters with inflation right. and rates going up. And labor and supply chain styles. Everything. And everything. Just about yeah. everything. Yeah. OK. Uh, Ed Ludlow, thank you for that update. Appreciate it. And that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. We're back tomorrow. We've got a packed show. Airbnb CEO Brian Chesky will be back. He'll talk about the company's new redesign, changes to shirt search. We've also got ARM CEO Renee Haas and the CEO of Sonos, Patrick Spence. Big show tomorrow. 
Don't forget to check out our podcast daily. You can find it anywhere you get your podcasts. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.